Well, good morning to everyone. So we come to his word today, the word that he himself has given to us. And we continue in our study of the book of Hebrews, and we'll be in chapter 4. We're only going to look at two verses this morning, verses 12 and 13. And these verses do come on the, the heels of the warning that he's given to remain diligent, to remain faithful and true and consistent in our confession of faith that we've made before him. And this particular passage speaks about the Word of God. And so we're going to talk about why that's here in a few moments and what this is meant to communicate to us as we try to be diligent and hold fast to the confession of our faith. So I want to just read these words with you this morning. Verse 12, Hebrews chapter 4. <clears throat> For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. <clears throat> Father, there are many, many things that we have to be grateful to you for, but I, I suppose that among the greatest of those is the fact that death was arrested by the resurrection power of God when the tomb became empty. So we come today to ask that you would impart that kind of life to us through your word, through your spirit, through your son, in whose name we pray, amen. I think I can probably speak for all of us in this room when I would say that one of the greatest joys of our lives is going to the doctor. <laughs> right? Amen. Well, it's, it's not so bad going to the doctor, but when you go there, you know, they don't cut you any slack whatsoever. They, they call you in, into the back part, and the first thing that happens when you step through that door is what? Would you step right up here, sir? No, I don't want to do that. You know why we don't want to do that, don't you? Because something there is about to tell us the truth about ourselves. Right? So what, what do we do? We, we know that day is coming, and so about eight or ten days before, we start slacking up on what we're eating and exercising more and doing all the things, get a haircut so we'll be a little bit lighter, all these different things, you know, because we know that we're about to be encountering an instrument that is going to reveal to us some things about ourselves. And in the event that we get where we want to be before we go there, we joyfully jump up on those steps on that, and we get on that scale. And it's 10 pounds heavier than the one we have at home every single time. I don't understand it. But it's telling us things about ourselves. And, and so what happens is that whenever we come to the place in our lives where, where things begin to become personal about ourselves, sometimes we don't like the result that we hear unless the reports are great. This is similar to our spiritual journey. We, we walk this journey. We follow the Lord Jesus. We listen for the voice of God. And, and as we move forward in our lives, we, we begin to, to sense that maybe there's something a little bit off. And so we begin to try to evaluate and assess and diagnose and figure out and then correct because we're, we're great at that. And so what we do is, is we, we try to retool our lives or reset. In Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, the writer has issued this very strong warning. And it's against resisting and rebelling and retreating from their confession of faith in Christ. And, and he's identified the heart as the seat of rebellion. He, he said that disobedience and resistance to God are located in this seed of rebellion in the heart. And, and so what he does after he gives this strong, stern warning, he encourages and he says, let us therefore be diligent to enter the rest that God has provided. And we talked all about rest last week. 
but, but he calls for diligence and, and, and faithfulness. And then, of all things, he, he just kind of throws this passage out here in verses 12 and 13 that may, at first glance, not seem to have anything to do with anything that he's been talking about. He's, he's issuing this warning, let's be diligent to enter this rest. But then he turns his attention and he says, for the word of God is. Let's be diligent, let's be faithful, for the word of God is. So why is that here? Let me tell you what the word of God is this morning. It's the scale. It's the scale that we're going to step up on this morning. That is going to hopefully tell us some things about ourselves. Because we need that kind of help. We need that kind of assistance. And, and in the event that you find out this morning that, that your spiritual load, your spiritual heaviness is 10 or 12 pounds heavier than you thought it was, maybe it's time to cut some things loose. Maybe it's time to let your life come under the spotlight of the Word of God. So what's happening here is that we have this warning against retreating against disobedience, against rebellion. And so as he moves us into this section, he's essentially trying to tell, tell us and help us understand that disobedience is dangerous, and dangerous disobedience has to be diagnosed and defeated and deleted from our lives. Disobedience. That's what he's dealing with in this passage. He's talking to a group of people who are no longer walking in obedience. Their hearts are turning rebellious. Their hearts are becoming hard toward God. And so he lays this passage out before us. And he lets us know that this word of God is here because what he knows is what you and I need to know, and that is that before the disobedience and rebellious heart can be dealt with, it's got to be identified. It's got to be revealed. And, and I know how good we are we, we might jump up and say, hey, I can identify my waywardness. I, I'm good at reading my heart. I, I'm good at, at listening for the voice of God and, and just responding with sensitivity to everything he's saying to me. And, and that, that's all well and good, but if I may, no, you're not. Okay? Now, now I, know, I know that we all have sort of this idea that we know ourselves better than anybody else. But let me tell you something that God's Word says about you and about me. It says about us that our hearts are deceitful and wicked and that no one can know it. And so either the Word of God is correct or I'm correct in assessing myself. But I want to tell you what he's saying to us today. He's saying don't let the assessment of your life and your faith and your commitment and your consistency to Christ be determined by you. Because there is a standard before you. There is a source that you can go to that has the great skillfulness and capacity that's needed to, to look into your heart and to show you yourself. So what we see is that he's presenting for us the authoritative source that determines whether we're living diligent lives or not. And, and so he's told us to pursue diligence in holding fast to our conf confession and the writer follows this warning with these words that tell us we do not have to wonder about our resolve. We don't have to try to figure out how resolved, how resolute, how committed, how consistent we are because there is a, a, a standard. There is only one sufficient standard for evaluating our resolve, and that standard is the Word of God. Now, I want to tell you very clearly this morning that if you've been taking it upon yourself to evaluate and assess your spirituality, your walk with God, if, if you've been trying to figure out on your own how to do this and what, what, what the truth about your life is, you've been looking to the wrong source. I'm not a mechanic, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn one time. <laughs> No, seriously, I, I, you know, I've tinkered. I, I, had a, I had a brother who was such a crackerjack mechanic. He was just brilliant. And he would just shake his head at me when I started working on something, and then he would come along after me and really put it back together. But last week, I guess it was last week, about 10 days ago or so, in my wife's vehicle, one of those little lights that you love to see comes on, those little engine, check engine lights. And, and you know, 
when they come on, they can be minimal or they can be really troubling. And so I went and had it checked out. And I talked to a couple of people. I talked to a friend who said, oh, that's that O2 sensor. It's no big deal. Ten minutes, five-eighths wrench. You can fix it. So I go to the parts store. And you know what I do? I do what any, any intelligent, non-mechanically inclined individual would do. I, get, I go to YouTube, of course. What, do you, what else are you going to do? Because that's where you're going to find the way to do what you need to do. I go to a source beyond myself. And sure enough, an hour and a half later, I had it fixed. My point is that I didn't know exactly what needed to be done. I thought I had an idea, but the Word of God is the source beyond ourselves that is sufficient to help us know, understand, reveal to us who we are and what's going on in our heart. We don't have the capacity to do that, and we need to step to a source that is beyond ourselves. And God has given us that source, and it's the only source that is objective. It's the only source that is sufficient to help us know who we are before God. Now, there are a lot of different nuances of of ways that God speaks that are coming out and down the pike these days. And there are some who who will tell you that, yes, God's Word is, is an objective source, but it really doesn't speak to the realities of our day. And so you have to interpret and you have to get along with God and let Him speak to you in your own spirit and, and in your own heart. And, and, and then whatever he says to you there is, is what you need to follow. Not, no, what you need to follow is what God has given us as his objective truth that stands before us as this sufficient standard for evaluating our resolve and our commitment. So it's the word of God. What does he say about it? Interesting things. He describes it. The word of God is living. The word that's used to talk about living there is that, that word that we get zoology. Z-O-A is the Greek word, zoe, life. He says the Word of God is life. It's alive. It has a vitality to it. It's dynamic. He says the Word of God is powerful. This is the word, if you transliterate it, it would be our word energy. He says the Word of God is energetic. It's filled with energy. It's great in its authority. It's powerful. He says it's sharp, razor sharp, keen, capable of cutting, capable of slicing as though it were a two-edged sword. This is a weapon of warfare that he's giving. And so what, what's happening here is that as the writer re- writes these words to these Hebrew believers who are thinking about backing out of their commitment to Christ, he's saying this to them. I don't know what you're using to evaluate your standard and your understanding of who God is, but the Word of God is the only sufficient standard which is set before us to help us And it serves as an objective standard by which diligence may be determined. So he's saying to them, trust the word. Don't trust your heart. Don't trust your mind. Don't lay your life along some other person and let them be the standard by which you evaluate the level of your spiritual resolve, your spiritual commitment, your spiritual pursuit, your spiritual depth. Don't lay your life along somebody or some book or some other resource. Lay your life alongside the word of God and let the word of God determine your faithfulness. So I don't know what you use to gauge what faithfulness is like in your life. But if it is anything other than Scripture, you need to go back to the source, the Word of God. But when you do, when you do, you need to start getting ready because there may be a little bit of discomfort. Remember that that scale thing. It evaluates but it reveals. So let's see what he says that it does. He talks about the Word of God this way. He says that the Word of God pierces even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So there's a process of evaluation that's in front of us. And and so he he says whenever this word is laid alongside of those who claim their belief is sufficient, it goes to work. And what it does is it, first of all, pierces. That means that the word of God goes deep into the person that we are. It's not some surface level evaluation. He says that the word of God is piercing. 
It, it moves deep into the sum and substance of our lives. It goes internal on us. In other words, it, it goes to the, to the depths of our heart. And so, you know, the truth is that we can sit in this room today and we can look around and we can see people and, and we can look at their faces and we can put names with those faces and we can say, I know that person, I know that person, I know that person, and I know a lot of you, most every one of you. But the truth is, I don't really know you. I know the you that you want me to know. I know the you that you choose to let me know. Fact is, there's a part of you behind the surface that I'll never know. But let me tell you who does. Let me tell you what gets into that part of who we are. It's the Word of God. Whenever we interact with the Word of God and we let the Word of God become internalized in our lives, it begins to do something in the real us, the real person that we are. It begins to speak to us in, in the, the depths of our being, our essence, our soul. So he says that it, that it pierces. But he also says it divides. Look at what he says. It, it, it pierces even to the division of soul and spirit. In other words, when it gets inside of us, it lays things open. It separates things out in there so that you can kind of allow the Word of God to look into the different aspects of your living. So the internalization of God's Word is to place our lives in the capable hands of God who, like a skilled surgeon, takes the scalpel of truth and carefully and meticulously exposes us to ourselves. How many of us are up for that? How many of us are really ready not to hear what our brothers and sisters in Christ's assessment of our lives is, but to hear what God says about us? How many of us are willing to undergo that intensive of an investigation and evaluation and assessment of our spiritual journey. How many of us are willing to say, Lord, here I am. Please take that word that you said pierces and penetrate my life with it, internalize that in me, and begin to expose to me who I am before you, how I look to you. So he says that it pierces and it divides. He also says it detects. Look at, look at what it says here. It is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The Word of God is able to read your mind. That's scary, isn't it? I mean, the Word of God, it says, is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. In other words, it goes to the place where you think and it begins to tell you if you're thinking rightly, if you're thinking consistently with God's truth and God's Word and God's way. The mind. That's, that's why Paul writes to be renewed or transformed in your mind. That's why Paul writes to the Corinthian church and says that we need to allow the weapons of our warfare, which this is a sword, it's a weapon, to take captive unto obedience every thought. Our mind, that battlefield, that place where warfare is constant, where the enemy always wants to try to find some way to step in there and to, to, to set up shop and, and to build strongholds and to take areas of our mind and to cause us to think the way he thinks, to, 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 to tell us that the Word of God says this, but does it really mean that? You remember how that happened in the garden? Yea, hath God not said... Is this, God didn't really say that, did He? And that's what He does. So we put the Word of God alongside everything that tries to captivate our minds. And if, and if the Word of God says that it doesn't belong there, get rid of it. But it also talks about the intents of the heart. That's talking about our motivations. That's talking about our heart. Remember, He said that rebellion and disobedience is seated in the heart, the, the center of our emotions and our our, our being. And so he says that, that the Word of God is able to look into our heart and to expose any motive or intention that, that, is, that is against or different than the Word of God and the way of God. The heart. He says it's able to let you see if your heart is where it needs to be. And so he, he speaks about these realities as the method, the process of evaluation. 
And so he, he is essentially encouraging everyone to allow the Word of God to be that which evaluates and reveals and exposes you know, where your heart is, where your heart is. So, so he tells us what's really going on in us whenever we lay our lives alongside the Word of God. It's, there's an unrestricted detection process that it's able to carry out within us. So we have this sufficient standard that God has placed before us as he warns against stepping apart from our resolve, our diligence, and our faith. There's this standard, and, 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 and there's a process that, that is used for evaluation. And then once we come to the place where we've allowed the honesty of the Word of God to challenge us in our dishonesty or in our disillusionment, and, and, and we, we become right in the sight of God, there's something else that happens, and that is that we understand that, that by making ourselves accountable to the Word of God, that there is freedom in that accountability. Look at what he says anyway. He says, there's no creature hidden from his sight. All things are naked and open to him, to the eyes of him, to whom we must give an account or give account. So there's accountability here, but I want you to know that whenever you step on this scale, when your life is placed in the balance of the Word of God, and that, that balances out because you're right with God, you're where you need to be, your resolve is strong, your commitment is pure, your diligence is on track, you're pursuing with purpose and abandon the God who has called you to Himself, there is freedom in that accountability. There is liberty in making ourselves accountable to the Word of God. Actually, we're already known to Him completely anyway. Everything about us is bare before Him. So we might as well accept the accountability that the Word of God wants to hold over our lives. Because when our lives or weighed out against that word and that scale balances, that, that is amazing liberty. To know that we're right in the sight of God, that we're being consistent with the word that he's set in front of us, that we're living the life he's called us to. So, the word of God digs around in our lives, probes us, pierces, penetrates, might make us uncomfortable a little bit, might even hurt some. But whenever it excises from our lives whatever doesn't need to be there, there's a, a lightness and a liberty that comes with that. But let me tell you, there's a, there's a, a, a variable in this. There's a variable in this, and it's not the Word of God, and, and it's not the voices of the world, but it's you and your approach. It's how you come to the Word of God. It's how you see the Word of God, how you view the Word of God, how you submit to the Word of God. And so what happens is that the approach to the source, the objective source of evaluation for our lives will determine our status under the Word of God. As we come to the Word of God, the way that we come is of utmost importance. So I want to tell you just two things about that as we kind of wrap this up this morning. The first thing that I want to say to you is this. Please hear me and hear me well. A haughty spirit indicates divine disfavor in your life. If, if you come to the Word of God with a haughty spirit and, 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 and in, your, in your interaction with God, you use the words they and them a whole lot more than you use, use the words I and me. There may be a problem. We, we are really, really good at praying that God would work in everybody else's life. If we come to the Word of God as if we don't need the correction, we don't need the direction, we don't need the instruction, we don't need the conviction, if we come to the Word of God as if this is something that everybody else needs more than me, there may be a problem. That's the indicator of a heart that isn't close, of a heart that's distant. A haughty spirit 
them, they. Oh, those people are so bad. They're so broken. They're so critical. They're so, so self-centered. They, they, they. What about me? Y'all remember that old spiritual song, don't you? It's not my mother or my brother or my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me. What about me? When we come to God with a haughty spirit, we can assume, and rightfully so, that God is not favorable toward that. So, uh, the opposite of that is a humble surrender. A haughty spirit versus a humble surrender. And a humble surrender indicates diligent pursuit of the heart of God and the things of God. Humble surrender. Th those, are, those are strong and powerful words for the person who wants to, to live in the fullness of God's blessing and God's, God's leadership and God's direction and God's purpose in his life. If we come to the place where we can humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, believing that what he said is true, that he then will exalt us whenever the time is right. He'll raise us up when he's ready. He'll do whatever he wants to in our lives. A humble surrender, a humble spirit that says, Lord, I want your word to show me everything about me that might need to be different, that might need to be changed, that might need adjustment, that might need carving out of my life. I just want to hear from you, Lord. And, and, and so we surrender ourselves to the process of whatever God wants to do and whatever God needs to do in our lives to make sure that we're pure and holy and right in His sight. Because the Word of God is living. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. And, and it will pierce and divide. It, it'll separate, it'll open up your life so that you can see what God sees and, and, and submit to the Holy Spirit what needs to be submitted for cleansing and for His handiwork to be accomplished. For we are His handiwork. We are. And He wants to work in our lives and conform us to the image of His Son. But He also wants us to be diligent to enter into that rest, to live in the fullness of all that he's created us for and that he's created for us. So this is a word about the word this morning. It's that simple. This is a word about the word of God and its interaction with us and our interaction with it. And, and, and it's, again, it's the, it's the conclusion of this warning that, that is given under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to these believers who are faltering, who are slipping, who are stepping apart from, from their surrender and their commitments and their resolve to God. I wonder if this lands on any one of our doorstep this morning. I wonder if there's any word in here for me, for me, or for that me, or that me, or that me, or that me. Is there a word in here that God is trying to say to you? Is he telling you to quit trying to determine your own level of surrender and commitment to Christ without the objective source, but to look to the word and let the word decide? That's not only true about our confession of faith in Christ, but it's also true about our commitment to him as our Lord and Savior. If, if you've never come to the place where you have trusted Jesus as your Savior and you're here today and you know that if, if something happens that, that you're, you're measuring your hope for eternity against something other than the Word of God, you, you're measuring it against maybe some evaluation or assessment that the world provides where it says, if you're a pretty good person, you're going to be okay. Surely God wouldn't, he wouldn't judge you because you're a good person. You don't do a lot of bad things. Now the standard by which we're judged is the Word of God that lifts up the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ and says that our path to, to, to the, the salvation and the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness of sin is by bowing our lives before Him and acknowledging that we are sinners in need of a Savior and that we can't 
take care of our own sin, but Jesus died and shed his blood so that our sin could be forgiven. And so we place our faith in that, in him, and we trust him. Not, not, not comparing our lives to those alongside of us or comparing it to some other standard that we've concocted or bought into, but comparing it to, to the Lord Jesus and the word that he gives us that says, all who look to him can be saved. Maybe today, maybe today you're, you're, you're trusting in the wrong source and you need to come to Jesus. Listen, I want to ask everybody, if you don't mind, just to bow your heads for a moment. We now come to the place in our, in our time of worship where we want to give people the opportunity to, if, if, there's, if there are questions or needs that you need help with, we want to give you a chance to just, just uh, flesh that out. The way that we do that here is we, we have an, an open invitation and myself and Brother Steve will be down front here in just a moment and if you need to speak with any one of us about anything related to where you are spiritually or where you need to be spiritually, whether you're seeking salvation or trying to get your life back on track or thinking about becoming a member of this church or you just need prayer in some area, we're here to help with that. That's what this is all about. And so in just a moment after I pray, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the opportunity to, to just come to one of us if you need to. So right now I wanna ask you to stand with your heads bowed and I'm gonna lead us in prayer. And then following that, we'll be down front to meet you. Father, we come now in Jesus' name, asking Lord that we would center and focus on only Jesus right now. That we would look to you and listen to your voice and. Try, Lord, with everything within us to understand that you call us to yourself. You speak to us. You draw us. And as you do, please give us grace to simply respond, to just say yes to you right here, right now, with everything that's within us. In Jesus' name, with your heads still bowed, if you need to come, you come right now. Come saying, I'm trusting Jesus. Come saying, I want to be a part of this church family. Come asking us to pray with you about anything, and we're here to help. We're here. These are the Groves, Randy and Sherry, and they're coming today saying that they believe God has led them to be a part of this church family. So if you'd join me in affirming that decision by them, would you let them know that this morning with a big amen? Amen. Also, we have an absentia uh, uh, coming for membership uh, Phyllis Lawson and that is Buck's mother and so um, we're, we're going to be getting all that squared away but if you'd join me in, again in affirming and welcoming her as she's physically unable to be here today would you let her know that with a big amen also